This is the whole simple explanation for why regular exercise and intermittent fasting are good for health. These repeated cycles of mild stress and recovery and growth allow for, for optimum growth and function of your muscles, your nerve cells. The growth in the nerve cells is increased. Welcome to the Seamland Podcast, I'm your host Seam Lund and today our guest is Mark Metzen. Mark used to be a professor of neuroscience at John Hopkins University and known for his early research on intermittent fasting. The National Institute of Health considers him one of the world's top experts on the potential cognitive and physical health benefits of intermittent fasting. This episode is brought to you by Blue Blocks, my favorite light and sleep optimization companies. Artificial light at night exposure is associated with diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer and Alzheimer's. Blue Blocks provides the highest quality blue blocking glasses that filter out the specific wavelengths that have been shown to suppress melatonin in studies. Melatonin is more than the sleep hormone. It's also vital for longevity, anti-aging and immunity. Artificial light exposure suppresses melatonin up to 99% and makes your brain think that it's daytime before bed. That's why I love using Blue Blocks to guarantee my body is making high amounts of melatonin prior to sleep. They also have daytime lenses that you can use to reduce digital eye strain and retinal damage when working in front of a computer all day. You can get a sweet 15% discount of all the Blue Blocks glasses, red light light bulbs, red light devices and sleep masks if you head over to blueblocks.com forward slash seamlund and use the code seam15. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X dot com forward slash seamlund and the code is seam15, S-I-I-M-15. Mark, welcome back to the show. Uh, it's nice to talk to you again, Sim. Yeah, it was like two years ago I uh, checked uh, the last time talked. And uh, yeah, I mean, two years is not a lot in terms of scientific research. <laughs> but uh, I do think that there have been like some pretty interesting studies recently coming out. And you also uh, released uh, your book uh, on the topic. So uh, we'll be talking about that today. And today we also have a co-host, uh, my girlfriend uh, Inka, <laughs> who has also a master's uh, in uh, neuropsychology, and uh, she'll be also basically helping us to, you know, ask questions about brain function and fasting and uh, those kind of things. So I think it's going to be a pretty interesting show. Uh, but uh, yeah, maybe let's just talk. You know, start with uh, your book. You know. Uh, yeah. So what what happened was. Um... A little over two years ago, I retired from my laboratory chief position at the NIH. And that gave me some time. <laughs> While I was a lab chief, I had a big lab, a lot of postdocs, graduate students, uh, junior scientists under me. I didn't have time to write a book on intermittent fast, on the science of intermittent fasting, even though we started research on intermittent fasting in the 1990s. And in the meantime, <laughs> as you know, uh, intermittent fasting has become popularized, actually based on some human studies we did with Michelle Harvey in England. Uh, and we published a paper in 2011, and then a producer for the BBC, Michael Mosley, saw the, the article, and he did a documentary for the BBC on intermittent fasting, and then that kind of ignited the internet chatter. Hmm. And, in the, and then since then, there have been now more than 100 human trials of intermittent fasting, a lot of them in people with obesity, type 2 diabetes, but also some in, in healthy younger people like yourself who, uh, in my looking at your arms, it looks like you do some resistance training. And uh, we can talk about uh, all of this. Uh, and yeah, and I think that the thing I'm optimistic about now is that a lot of physicians have become aware of intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. and they're able to at least talk to patients a little bit about it. And there's a lot of interest and in clinical trials going on now in patients with various diseases, cancers, inflammatory disorders, um, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, even uh, some brain disorders. Mm. Uh, yeah. 
So anyway, I, I got around to writing a book on the science of intermittent fasting. There are really no books that go into any detail at all on the science of intermittent fasting. I tried to write my book, The Intermittent Fasting Revolution, at a level that at most educated people can understand a lot of it. And my goal was to educate people. Uh, from a practical standpoint, intermittent fasting is it's simple. It's just an eating pattern that involves uh, extended time periods, at least say 14, 16 hours with no energy intake and, and that repeated regularly, daily time restricted eating, a couple days a week and eat only one moderate size of meal. So that part is trivial, but mm. I think a lot of people are interested in what's going on in their brain and body uh, when they're doing intermittent fasting. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and uh, actually, when last I talked, you had recently published this uh, study about basically intermittent fasting and uh, you know claiming that uh, it's more than just you know the calorie restriction or more than just weight loss. That there's also like all these other things that happen in the body. Uh, all these beneficial processes. Um, so yeah, maybe like gonna give an overview about those things as well. Like what is happening inside the body that is so <laughs> beneficial uh, when you are doing intermittent fasting or when you are doing this uh, time restricted eating. Uh, one effect of intermittent fasting that anybody who's looked into it all at all knows is that with the, these extended time periods without food, again at least 14, 16 hours. Um, your body switches from using glucose stores in the liver to using fats and the ketones that are produced from the fats. And so this metabolic switch from glucose to ketones accounts for the fact that humans, animals in the wild, predators, for example, can go extended time periods, days, even weeks with no food intake uh, because they're using their fat stores and the ketones are supplying their cells with energy. Now, ketones have been studied and, and the two ketones that are, I'm talking about are beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. Okay, so that, those are the fuels for your cells when you're fasting. Um, I should also say, before I get into what's happening in, in the brain cells, is that if you exercise in a fasted state, so for example, say you, you eat dinner at 6, 7 p.m., you get up at 7, you know, whatever, put your clothes on, hopefully, uh, go out and run, uh, run for an hour. What happens is th this will uh, enhance the elevation in ketones. So, for example, uh, and that's something I experienced. Well, we can talk about endurance. I'm most interested or have most knowledge about endurance uh, athletes. I used to be kind of a semi-good distance runner and did a lot of trail running, uh, you know, like half marathon trail races was what I liked the most. Uh, but anyway, I personally found that uh, for these kinds of distances anyway, I perform better if I start in a ketogenic state uh, and, and this I discovered accidentally. I would go into the laboratory like six in the morning, and then I'd work till like three in the afternoon. And then I'd drive, we have some nice trails near us where I ran. I'd drive to the trail, it'd be four o'clock, and I'd run. And for a long time, I would eat like at 11 in the morning and then go running. But Sometimes, and I usually bring my lunch with me. So sometimes I forgot to bring my lunch. So I just, you know, go trail on an hour trail run 
uh, having not eaten anything. And my own personal impression was that I ran better when I hadn't eaten anything that day. And this actually makes a lot of sense from an evolutionary perspective because animals in the wild, for example, a, a predator, they have to be able to expend a lot of effort, physical effort to chase prey animals, find them, chase them when they're in a food deprived state, which it can be a week, two weeks. And also their brain has to be working well. And so my, my own regimen is I don't eat breakfast and then I exercise in the morning and then I eat all my food in a six hour time window each day. And I find my most productive time of the day from a cognitive standpoint is in the morning when I'm in a fasted state. Um, okay, so what's happening in cells? Uh, many things. So ketones account for some of the beneficial effects of, of intermittent fasting. The ketones are a good energy source for cells. They're more efficient energy source than glucose. Uh, and of course, the, the ketones and the glucose go into the cells and then they're metabolized in, in the mitochondria, the energy powerhouse of the cells. And then, the, so the glucose and ketones can both be used to generate ATP in the mitochondria. Now, during this process of, of ATP production in the mitochondria, free radicals are produced. And uh, actually, it turns out free radicals, they're generally thought of as bad, but they actually have normal functions in cells. Uh, but anyway, there's less free radicals produced with keep when the cells use ketones compared to glucose. So when your cells are using glucose, there's more free radical damage to your cells than when they're using ketones. Okay, so then the ketones also have uh, signaling functions. They can stimulate cells and affect certain genes. Uh, turn, turn on certain genes that do good things for cells that make them more resistant to stress and um, more energy efficient. Um, so I'm, we studied in the brain, this gets a little complicated, and, um, but just bear with me. If, if you read my book, it hopefully, yeah, I'm, I'm talking fast and, but my book, you can read more slowly. <laughs> uh, so in the brain, there's a protein that has been studied for many decades called BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor. BDNF has been shown to be, play a critical role in learning and memory. It also, exerts an anti-anxiety, anti-depressant effect. And two things we know, three things we know increase BDNF levels in the brain. One is what we're doing now, we're keeping our brain cells active by thinking uh, intensively. So neurons are more active, BDNF levels increase. Physical exercise, particularly aerobic exercise, increase BDNF levels in the brain a lot. Um, and then the third is fasting, intermittent fasting. So BDNF levels increase. That enhances learning and memory. It actually increases the number of connections between nerve cells, the number of synapses. Uh, most of the things I'm talking about have been shown very convincingly in animals, laboratory rats and mice, where we can actually take out their brains and you know cut them into sections and look under the microscope and count synapses and 
all these kinds of things. Uh, but there is evidence that exercise and activity in neural networks increase BDNF levels in humans. So BDNF is important for learning and memory. It also increases the resistance of nerve cells to stress. We showed this back in the 19, well, 80, 90s, early 1990s. If we just take nerve cells and culture and we expose them to BDNF, then the, more, the nerve cells are more resistant to being damaged by free radicals, by conditions that we think mimic changes, bad changes that are going on in the brain with aging and in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so intermittent fasting, increase BDNF, increase learning and memory, increase stress resistance of neurons. Uh, recently, we found that intermittent fasting and exercise through BDNF increase will increase the number of healthy mitochondria in the nerve cells. So the nerve cells are then better able to generate the ATP that they need to run the synapses and function. So anyway, that's uh, I'm rambling a little here, but th those are some of the things uh, that we found. Mm. Is there some sort of like optimal time window for these benefits? <clears throat> might it be the, like some sort of prolonged fasting? Does it, is there any downside? Might it harm the brain? Is it like, is there some time effect up to which sort of brain benefits from fasting and when it starts to harm? What we know, so unfortunately, one 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 the kind of key question you're asking is, what's the optimal intermittent fasting eating pattern for brain health? And the answer is we don't know. <laughs> uh, the 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 studies out there. So look, for example, in our animal studies, we've used two different. Um, uh, eating patterns, intermittent fasting. One is every other day fasting. So 24 hours, no food. Next 24 hours, the animals have food available all the time. We just keep doing that. Uh, and then the other is daily time restricted eating where the animals will uh, eat all their food within like a four hour time window every day. And we never compared the every other day fasting to the daily time restricted eating in the same experiment. It was always separate experiments where we had a control group that were not on intermittent fasting. They had food available every day, all the time. And so we compared that control group to either every other day fasting or daily time restricted eating. And both intermittent fasting eating patterns, um, do the kinds of things I talked about uh, a few minutes ago that are good for the brain, enhancing learning and memory, making brain cells more resilient, able to resist stress, able to, uh, to maintain the energy uh, that keeps them uh, running well. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in humans, it's the same thing. There's no one has compared in the same study daily time restricted eating to what's now called 5 2 intermittent fasting, which was based on our early studies with the, the group in England. Uh, or uh, so we can't really say what's optimal. What we can say is compared to three meals a day plus compared to breakfast, lunch, dinner. In the evening snack, either daily time restricted eating or fasting a couple days a week, uh, improve improve health. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as very long fasts, that's another unresolved question. Uh, most of the the work there that I'm aware of comes from Europe. Uh, for example, in Germany. 
there is a, it's called the Butchinger uh, uh, cl their clinics. It's actually like a resort, but they have physicians and they have extensive experience over many decades with long fasts of typically they do 10 to, 12, 10 to 14 days uh, complete fast water. I think it's mostly water only. And they have done, they have collected data on, on people. Uh, so they come in, they will measure a number of things like blood pressure, heart rate, uh, they'll take blood and then, and then they'll have them, they'll be fasting for 10 to 14 days. And then at the end of the fasting period, before they eat, they'll do this, you know, blood pressure, take blood, then they analyze the blood. And so they have a lot of very clear evidence that there's improvement in health indicators, for example, improved insulin sensitivity, uh, reduced blood pressure and resting heart rate uh, during that two weeks. But what they don't have data on uh, is following up these people uh, after that. Because essentially, most of these people just do this once a year. And so an important question is, does that once a year long fast have, have a long-term benefit? Say the la that, so that the next year they're in better health. Mm. Um, we don't know. And the, the thing about these short fasts, like daily time-restricted eating, is they can be easily incorporated into somebody's daily routine. And once, once you've, you're adapted to the new eating pattern, adapted in terms of no longer being hungry during the time period you'd previously been eating, uh, a lot of people can stick with it. I've done this for more than 30 years. Hmm. And it's just, uh, and, and with, say a six, six hour time window each day, six to eight, it's, it's pretty easy to get enough calories to like Sim for you or your girlfriend, you know, you're pretty fit and don't have much fat. And uh, yeah, I think, so what are you doing Sim now? Are you, are you doing intermittent fasting? Yeah. I'm, uh, I've been doing that for like yeah, eight years, nine years. Yeah. And uh, for the last five years, I was doing like one meal a day mostly. Uh, but now for the last few months, I've been doing one meal a day, the majority of time, but uh, on some days I also have like a second small meal, but it's, but it's still within like six hours or something like that, all the calories, um, essentially all the meals. Are uh, six hours. How are you, how many, when you were on one meal a day, how many calories were in that meal? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's a, uh, it's been, it's been uh, you know, uh, relatively moderate. Like I, uh, well, like I haven't like specifically counted, although I would guess if, if I were to guess, then it's like 2,200, maybe 2,500. Okay. 25 oh, yeah. I do have like, a, you know, I do this hack basically that to build muscle and still get stronger in the gym, then I consume like a protein shake during my workout uh, and still eat one meal a day. So that's been the one of the best, at least, you know, best ways to maintain uh, like progress in uh, the resistance training uh, and, st and still eating one meal a day. If I were to do only one meal a day, then it's pretty hard to build muscle and strength. Um, but it's fine with endurance or cardio. Like uh, it, it doesn't hinder my cardio vascular exercise either. But when it comes to like strength training and such, then I do find it valuable to have like a, that's basically like a second meal, but it's not a real meal. It's just like a protein shake um, in there. And uh, that's only maybe like 100 and 150 calories and the rest of the calories will be coming from that one meal. Um, and, and was that one meal, uh, is that ketogenic? I mean, that, that's a lot of calories all at once, right? Yeah, well, uh, I'm pretty good at eating or I'm able to eat a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's not, it's not ketogenic uh, because it's, first of all, it's gonna be like pretty high in protein as well. So it's gonna be not keeping me in ketosis per se, I'm not worried about that. I'm not uh, trying to be in ketosis with that one meal. Um, I do eat carbs on the days that I um, work out. Uh, so yeah. it's a 
uh, it's like, and it's not like super high in fat either. I don't add like MCT oil or stuff. Um, I do eat like, you know, uh, regular meat, uh, vegetables, tubers, some fruit, um, eggs, fish, and those kind of things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty easy actually for me, at least. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel, you know, bloated or I don't feel discomfort from eating that. Uh, maybe my digestion is very good, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Where were we? Do what else would you like me to talk about? You want me to get in some detail on um, what's going on in the brain? Uh, I've I've talked some, but th there's th there's much more. Um, yeah, it would be like yeah. interesting to know some of the you know, some of the mechanisms, for example, involved in the main neurotransmitter systems like glutamate and GABA, and how might fasting. Ah affected those or um maybe the brain inflammation or those well, kind of things. Okay. that's yeah. that that's that's perfect i'm it, it just so happens that I've, I've written a second book it's uh it's at the publisher i'm sure i'm gonna have to do some revisions but the title of the book is sculptor and destroyer the story of glutamate, the brain's most important neurotransmitter. So if I ask people in general to name, name a neurotransmitter, so I'm talking about just general lay people, not neuroscientists, uh, or to say, ask them, what do you think the most important neurotransmitter in the brain is? The answer I get most commonly is dopamine or Yes, and other people think serotonin. And it turns out that more than 90% of the neurons in our brains deploy glutamate as their neurotransmitter. Glutamate is the excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. Without glutamate, your brain goes black. These other neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, they only... The only way they affect our behavior is by modifying the ongoing activity in the glutamatergic neural networks. Okay. So it turns out that, and, and my early work um, when I was a postdoc, I discovered that I was studying brain development essentially and using uh, cultured nerve cells. Uh, and a little bit in animal models. And I discovered that glutamate plays a very important role during brain development in controlling the growth of the dendrites of the neurons and the formation of synaptic connections between the neurons. So, and that was kind of important at the time because back then uh, in the 1980s, it was generally thought that glutamate functions after synapses are formed, but I showed that it plays an important role in, in the construction of the neural networks. And then I got interested in cell death, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, because it turns out if, if you expose neurons to high levels of glutamate, the glutamate can kill them the glutamate excites them to death. And that's what occurs in an epileptic seizure where the glutamatergic neurons are firing out of control. And if, if that happens too much, it can kill the neurons. And we think in age-related neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's diseases, there's a more subtle, insidious, what we call excitotoxicity, neurons being damaged by glutamate that occurs in these diseases. And in fact, patients with Alzheimer's disease, they have like 20, 30 fold increased incidence of seizures compared to an age matched person without Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so. In this second book I'm writing, I talk all about that stuff, the, the roles of glutamate in the brain development, learning and memory diseases. 
but getting back to my book that's out now on intermittent fasting, it turns out that, uh, that so this gets back to your question. Uh, I'm sorry, your <laughs> Sim's girlfriend, Ika? Or, Inca, yes. Yeah, Inca, about glutamate and GABA. We found by recording the activity of glutamatergic neurons in a brain region called the hippocampus, which is critical for learning and memory, uh, and it's also involved in anxiety and mood. We found that when we put mice on intermittent fasting, there's actually increased GABA inhibition of the glutamatergic neurons. So glutamate is the excitatory neurotransmitter. GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter. GABA functions to keep the glutamatergic neurons under control in a, so that they're being, when after they're activated, then they're inhibited, which is important to allow, to prepare for further signals coming in. Anyway, bottom line is that the animals adapted to intermittent fasting, there's better control of the, of the neural network activity in the brain, and that occurs through enhanced GABA activity. Uh, and is, the, is this because of the increased ketone bodies in the brain? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. It, it could very well be. Mm. And uh, what, what Inc. is... Now her question is, is very logical uh, based on her knowledge of the brain and, and mind. Um, ketogenic diets are prescribed sometimes for people with epilepsy, particularly those that don't respond well to um, drugs. And so it's very well established that ketones can uh, suppress neural excitability and, and prevent seizures epileptic seizures. Uh, and yeah, if we, if we take culture, the very simple experiment, take cultured glutamatergic neurons, and, and these neurons in culture, they will form neural networks. And th they actually have, there's ongoing electrical activity. If we simply add ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate, for example, to the culture, then the neurons are, uh, 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 they're more able to resist being overexcited by glutamate. So that's like direct evidence that the ketones are sufficient to uh, reduce neural excitability. Mm. Yeah. Any other questions? Now I, sh now, I should say that the ketones do not explain all the beneficial effects of intermittent fasting and exercise on the brain. Mm. Yeah, well, I was going to actually yeah, talk about that. You know, besides all those things, there's also mm. autophagy that's uh, also involved with uh, brain health and basically cognitive function and preventing neurodegeneration. So, yeah, maybe you can talk about that. I don't yes. know, start with the brain autophagy, but then maybe you can carry on with other parts of the body. <laughs> so your, your, your viewers will have seen in your, and I kind of scrolled through your previous podcast, they can refer back to your podcast that focus on autophagy. But essentially autophagy is a cellular garbage disposal and recycling system that in which damaged proteins, damage dysfunctional mitochondria, uh, other damage molecules, they're detected and physically moved to an acid bath that chews up you know, the damaged proteins, mitochondria, and actually it's really interesting. There's actually some recycling of amino acids so and if, if an amino acid is not damaged, it can actually be reused to, for protein synthesis. Uh, 
so that's like, like the recycling aspect of it. Uh, so what this autophagy system does is it, it clears out any molecular damage. You, typically that damage is caused by free radicals. Free radicals damage proteins, they damage D your DNA, they can cause mutations, they damage the, the lipid membranes of your cells. Uh, and any of that damage, if it becomes excessive, can lead to dysfunction and even death of cells. So this autophagy is very important for function and survival of all cells, including nerve cells. Um, so fasting and also exercise will stimulate autophagy. Now, at the same time that autophagy is being enhanced, uh, pro overall protein synthesis in the cells is uh, turned down. And that happens because there's a pathway called mTOR, which, uh, so Sim, when you take your protein shake, uh, mTOR is activated and that very quickly and efficiently moves the amino acids, you know, from your, your protein that you consume, moves it into the cells and puts the cells in a growth mode. So during the fasting, and actually that's, uh, when you told me you're taking the protein shake while you're exercising, I got thinking, I, I don't know, maybe wait till after, but um, so that the fat during the fasting and exercise that typically stimulates autophagy and shuts down mTOR somewhat. Fasting definitely will shut down mTOR. Uh, and then, so the cells go into a stress resistance, conserve resources mode during fasting and maybe exercise. And then when you eat, rest, sleep, the cells go into a, a growth and plasticity mode. So I think your muscle cells don't get bigger while you're exercising, they get big, bigger while you're resting and when you eat. Yeah. So this, this is the whole simple explanation for why regular exercise and intermittent fasting are good for health. These repeated cycles of mild stress and recovery and growth allow for, for optimum uh, you know, growth and function of your muscles, your nerve cells. The growth in the nerve cells is increased number of synaptic connections, mm. which we've shown. And actually an increased number of nerve cells. There are stem cells in your brain that um, they're in your brain in the hippocampus brain region right now in all of our brains, some of them are dividing and some of them can stop dividing and form new nerve cells. Those new nerve cells can integrate into the neural circuits. Uh, in this brain region, the hippocampus, those stem cells are very important for what we call spatial navigation, spatial learning and memory. That is like right now, I'm looking out into the forest here by our house. And, you know, if I go out on a trail run, uh, while I'm running, uh, my brain is working, it's very active. Uh, and it, not only in the second by second aspects of the running and like, you know, putting my foot on that log and, and not, putting it on that rock and so on, remembering where I'm going so I don't get lost. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, intermittent fasting and exercise will enhance our the ability of our, us to remember things as we move through the environment. Mm. Um, and I, I think, uh, and I've published papers on this. Um, I'm a little concerned that uh, a lot of people nowadays don't physically move through the environment much. Mm. And during evolution, these brain systems for uh, generating cognitive maps, maps of our environment, you know, 
what did we see? When did we see it? What was it we saw? You know, was it a bear? Uh, you know, uh, where were the, the prey animals? You know, all of that um, we're not tapping into so much. Humans nowadays, our brains are very specialized for specific tasks, often just sitting in a computer, uh, kind of doing um, repetitive things, not moving through the environment. And in fact, there's evidence that the overall size of the brain, the human brain has gotten smaller in the last 10,000 years uh, uh, since the agricultural revolution and where we've, we have agriculture and uh, don't have to forage every day or hunt. Um, and that's based on measuring skull size of humans from say 12,000 years ago versus the you know, human brains today. So that's concerning. Our brains are getting smaller. Clearly we're, our neural circuits have been repurposed and and some of them can focus on specific tasks, but uh, it will be interesting to see what happens to general intelligence as we go forward. Hmm. Well, maybe we'll figure or develop some sort of, you know, drugs to help with the brain. Well, or or um, cyborgs or yeah. uh, brain computer interfaces. Then and, and there's actually you know this is there's people thinking about this and working on it with artificial intelligence. And, uh, mm. but for now, um, I think we and our, and, and another thing, you know, in the United States, obesity is a big problem. It's increasing in a lot of European countries. Uh, 40 years ago, uh, when I, or uh, whatever, when I first went to Europe. Uh, so back then there was already obesity was starting somewhat in the United States. And when I went to Europe back then, I like, wow, that there's, I don't see anybody who is, you know, obviously way overweight. Uh, now you see that some in Europe. Uh, if you go to Asia, not so much, although it's increasing there. And what, happen, what happens is there's this transgenerational um, propagation of poor uh, diet, eating patterns, lifestyle, such that kids who grow up in a family where their parents are sedentary and eat you know, fast food, junk food, um, the kids are very likely to have, adopt the same eating patterns. Uh, you know, so this is a con concern. So education, podcasts like you're doing now uh, are important. Uh, unfortunately, it's a, kind of a key thing though, Sim uh, is, and Inke is the people who are watching these podcasts are generally health conscious people who are already thinking about these things. So, you know, how do we, you know, how do we kind of attract people to these kinds of podcasts or spreading of information that uh, are not so health conscious and, and when they go online, they're not, they're not searching for something on exercise or diet or they're, you know, searching for whatever other things they search for, um, stock car racing in the United States, or, you know, American football, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. And I think that that's really the, uh, an important thing. How do we get, get access to these people and, and kind of tell them that, Actually, changing your lifestyle is not that hard if you can stick with like an intermittent fasting eating pattern for a month, or if you can get in shape over a period of a couple months. 
Uh, it won't be easy during that those first few months, but you know, at the end of those few months, you're you're going to be feeling better. There's there's just no doubt. You you lose some weight, you will feel better about yourself, and these things I'm talking about that are going on in the brain, your know, mood will increase, improve. Uh, yeah. So, I guess how do we? Have you thought about that, Sim? Because this is like a really important thing. We're we're kind of everybody's in their own little uh, what do you call it? Um, ah, I forgot what the term uh, bubble. <laughs> bubble, yeah. Everybody's in their own little bubble, and and how do we get out of that bubble? I've been thinking about this, and uh, yeah, you want to yeah. Mm, well, I had an idea actually on, on that, uh, that um, I think one of the biggest issues in this society, in this today's world is just the availability of poor products. Like when people go, for example, the food stores, there are majority of the products are not actually food. There are some, some like uh, processed um, food like things. And um, like studies in health psychology, for example, show that people just tend to go to what they are exposed to. So, for example, just placing a water uh, machine yeah. into a workplace make people drink more water. Yeah. Like making this information sort of um, available for them very easily would be one solution. And then also maybe <clears throat> somehow reducing some of the stuff that does bad for us. Mm. Um, yeah. So well, that that that's going to require some some yeah. regulation or some efforts by government. Mm -hmm. It would seem like now for for uh, workplaces, there are a lot of places people work physically where they have cafeterias, and that that would be important, right? To have only healthy food in those cafeterias. Um, mm. Or at least have it have it available. Like when I was studying at the UK, I was a bit shocked about the food choices at at some of the cafes around the campus, which was like there weren't a healthy option available. Uh, so even if you have the information, you still need the availability of of those healthy food options. Yeah, I have it so in my book. Um, so this is my book. The intermittent fasting revolution. I have a chapter on uh, what I call the dark forces. And uh, one of them is what you mentioned, Inca, the processed fast food industry, you know, where you just put corn syrup and everything, uh, or fructose, uh, highly addictive. Those those uh, turns out those simple sugars, glucose, fructose, you get a big dopamine surge. It's it's like taking a drug, mm. and people become addicted to it in the exact same way. The same changes in the neural networks with drug addiction. It's, uh, it's obviously it's not as bad as drug addiction, but and. Then another thing that happens with these simple sugars is as the person gains weight, the, uh, their brain does not respond to signals uh, that would normally be coming from the gut that tell the brain the gut's full. There's a, there's a hormone called leptin. And when you eat a meal, leptin's released actually from fat cells and it goes through the blood to your brain and it activates neural networks that tell you hey you're getting full stop eating well people with obesity they their brain does not respond to leptin so they actually they feel like they're hungry a lot you know and we see this in the united states we have uh we have these food bars, all you can eat. Food bars where you, you, I don't know, pay 
twenty dollars, and you know they have all sorts of meats, um, some you know desserts, some healthier food, and you know many number of times I've gone to these places. I actually used to go to these when I was a poor college student, and, and then I'd eat one meal a day, <laughs> and you know I, it's all you can eat, so I load up, but um. Anyway, you go there and you'll see these people with obesity. And like, I remember clearly once standing in line and these people with obesity around me talking, saying, I'm starving. I'm really starving. I can't wait to get in there and eat. Well, clearly they're not starving. They're, you know, 250 pounds, uh, you know, five foot, 10, I don't know, you know. Uh, no, they're not starving. Yes, they feel hungry. And the reason they feel hungry is what I said, because they've become uh, obese and the whole systems that control their food intake are out of whack. Mm. However, if they can change their eating, if they can reduce their calorie intake, intermittent fasting can help them do that if they can start to get some exercise, if they can stick with it for a couple months, they go back to that food bar and stand in line and they likely won't be saying I'm starving. Mm. Yeah, but what, what about the calorie restriction then? Yeah, like if you are eating, you know, once a day or even if it's bad food or even uh, like, you know, surplus, yeah, yeah. Will it still have like some, you know, health benefits? Or... No, 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 no. So I, I'm not saying they should go to a food bar for every meal. I, I'm saying they should. They no, should I'm, do... I'm, I'm just asking you, like, you know, are some of the benefits of intermittent fasting partly from the calorie restriction or? Um, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're getting back to the beginning. Your questions at the beginning now. Okay. So the first demonstration that I'm aware of that health benefits of intermittent fasting, some of them go beyond what can be accounted for by reduction in calorie intake, was a study we published in a, a journal called the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2003. So <clears throat> turns out, uh, so we work with rats and mice and there was this one strain of mouse, then when we put that on, put them on every other day fasting uh, over a period of weeks and months, there's essentially no calorie restriction because on the day they eat, they eat twice as much food as they normally would. Hmm. Okay. So they're doing every other day fasting, but their, their weekly calorie intake is not reduced compared to the control animals that have food available every day. Mm. And we found beneficial effects on the brain and with regards, we actually looked at an epilepsy model looking at uh, damage caused to neurons by epileptic seizures and the intermittent fasting protected the neurons against the seizures, even though there was no reduction in calorie intake. And we did, did some other things in animal models. And then in, in the studies with Michelle Harvey in England, uh, that got a lot of press and kind of ignited this intermittent fasting revolution. So those studies, we had two studies, both with 100 women. They were overweight. And we randomly, so 100, 100 women in each study, we randomly assigned them to either two days a week eating only about, what do we do, 600 calories on those two days. The other five days they were advised to eat normally, don't purposely overeat. So that was one group, that five, two intermittent fasting. So on those two days, we actually measured ketones, the ketones are up. So six, 600 calories is not enough to keep your liver uh, energy, Repleted. So on those two days that the women are in a ketogenic state. Okay, but then the other 50 women, we had them eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner 
but each meal had about 20% fewer calories than they would normally eat. Okay, and so the way we did that, because we did this kind of back of the napkin calculation that these two groups over time, and it was a six month study, would actually have the same calorie intake. So in other words, 600 calories two days a week uh, is equivalent to 20% reduction in calories uh, each day, but, but eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner spaced out so that in that group, the women weren't in a ketogenic state. They, and they, most of these women weren't exercising. So breakfast, lunch, dinner, uh, no ketogenic state versus two days a week ketogenic state. So both groups of women lost about the same amount of weight over six months. But the women on the 5-2 intermittent fasting had greater improvement in insulin sensitivity and they lost more belly fat, hmm. more, more abdominal. We just measured waist circumference. Uh, yeah, anyway, so the answer to your question is intermittent fasting can uh, can enable health benefits that go beyond this calorie restriction. So in someone like you, Sim, who's maintaining body weight or maintaining muscle mass, um, you know, I, I think intermittent fasting is good for your brain. I don't know if you can yeah, I do. tell me, tell me like, if you have any. Notice that, yeah, like I don't get any brain fog or, um, yeah, I also get the most productive things in the morning when I'm fasting, so. What would you? Uh, Inka, yeah. do, you, do you do this too, Inka? Yes, yes. And, and can... I, I have definitely the same experiences. And I actually noticed, um, so I had a chronic migraine when I was growing up. Ah. Fasting is not generally recommended to migraineurs a lot, but I was able to see reduction, clear reduction in migraines uh, when I started fasting. <clears throat> So I don't know, for me, it works. And um, it, how, how often, typically, I know it's kind of sporadic, but how often would you, the frequency of your migraines? Well, I had- In, in the past, in the past. Yeah, in the, in the past, when I was growing up, I had like from, depending on the age, basically, but from 15 to 10, 28 per month. So on some months I may wow. have like, a, yeah, uh, I was a pretty severe case, uh, but now currently it's like from zero to three. So mm. and it's like genetic, mm. your father also. Yeah, it's, it's genetic for sure. And, um, and did it, also my migraines yeah. are like very short currently, like they were, they may, may have lasted, the headache phase of the migraine may have lasted days for me, but currently it's maybe. And, and after you switch to, uh, not eating breakfast well i did a, i did a lot of things to be honest like basically it's the full lifetime a lifestyle ah, that helps so we, we can't say for sure it's the changed eating pattern no no but um for sure like i always had this uh, afternoon headache uh after lunch like around one or 12 and after i stopped eating breakfast i actually lost that afternoon sort of dip or headache what, what other changes did you make though, besides changing your eating pattern? Oh, I've done a lot of changes to my life, like uh, reducing food triggers, possible food triggers of migraine, just changing their dietary patterns in general. Um, but you, you change that all at the same time? No, gra gradually, yeah. Depending on my learning and what I was able to do at the time. Okay, mm -hmm. so the experience now, what I'm gonna say now is this, a joke i'm not serious mm -hmm. but if we're going to do an experiment what we'd have you now do now is uh, i guess first for a couple months stay on intermittent fasting but all the other things you do go back to the way they were mm -hmm. and then if you're well if you're if your migraine incidence increases then maybe it wasn't the ever that the intermittent fasting Mm. If your mind to gains don't increase, 
<clears throat> then stop intermittent fasting and see if they increase. Yeah. Don't 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 do this. But that thinking as a scientist, that's <laughs> yes, that's how it should be done. You you could kind of figure it out, but you could be a guinea pig. Uh, mm. But no, I'm glad you're not having migraines. So stick with what you're doing. <laughs> Yeah, and it was also the mental clarity, just like the general cognitive performance during the day. It just feels mm -hmm. feels good, and there is a good workflow. And I, I, I have a sister -in -law, sister in law who has migraines. Mm -hmm. um, have you gone to any online forums for migraines and or for intermittent fasting, and see if anybody mentions? Have you, Have you just went Google intermittent fasting migraines? Yeah, there is a lot of contradictory information in my opinion. Uh, uh, usually, okay. it's like they like they are just uh, it's not recommended, but it doesn't really specific specify to intermittent fasting. It's just fasting, like prolonged fasting. I think it's more like this kind of Ramadan type, mm. many days fasting, or just yeah. because of the increased uh, like cortisol and the sensitivity and mm, that it might trigger you know, or you know this. I'm glad you mentioned cortisol, the stress hormone from the adrenal glands. So, as you know, and many of your listeners know probably that calorie restricting, calorie restriction, intermittent fasting can extend lifespan in rats and mice by a lot. Mm. And there is this paradox for, for a long time that uh, Neuro endocrinologists measured and people who study stress measured cortisol. Actually, it's, a, it's corticosterone in the animals, but it's the same stress hormone. And when the animals are on intermittent fat, and we did this too with intermittent fasting, the cortisol levels are increased, which is, is consistent with the animals being under some like mild stress. So that's kind of paradoxical because typically you think of high cortisol levels as a bad thing, right? Well, acutely, it's a good thing, like during exercise or, or acute stress, but chronically, it's a bad thing. So what's the explanation of that? So when I was at University of Kentucky, uh, I had a graduate student who was, me and him were interested in this. And it turned out there was an endocrinologist there. And so what, there's different ways cells respond to cortisol. Uh, there are two receptors for cortisol in cells. One is called the glucocorticoid receptor or GR. The other is called the mineralocorticoid receptor or MR. With chronic uncontrollable stress like psychological stress, um, levels of MR go down and levels of GR stay up, okay? With intermittent fasting, levels of GR go down, levels of MR stay up. And, and we looked at this in the brain and neurons. So what we think is happening, at least in this regard, and, and I should say, there's evidence that chronic uncontrollable stress, being stressed out all the time is bad for your neurons. So apparently what's happening is the way that cells respond to this evolutionarily normal stress of intermittent fasting, Right, this is normal condition in prior to the agricultural revolution. Um, the way the cells respond to the stress is different. Uh, respond to the stress hormone is different depending on whether it's a bad stress or a good stress. Mm. Yeah, and fasting is one of those positive stressors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, to what do you think about them? And, and, and actually, I, I should tell you that I had my uh, cortisol levels measured, and they're at, they were at like the upper end of normal. Mm. Mine was actually low. Like mine was, yeah. Like I, I measured them as well 
maybe like a few months ago and uh, I had been fasting for maybe like 18 hours and uh, I had also consumed like caffeine before so my cortisol but my cortisol levels were still low <laughs> huh. not not like not like very low but you know obviously like within the like a lower end or kind of in the middle somewhere it's it, and, and they weren't like super high so no mine weren't uh, mine were in normal range but they were the upper part mine was in, okay um okay so what's next you have yeah I, I, I will start wrapping up as well uh, pretty much um maybe like a, a bit <laughs> i think a lot of people also want to know like you know calorie restriction does extend uh lifespan what is the what is the implications in intermittent fasting and also like you know when it comes to intermittent fasting studies then there's like in a might on a mouse like one day of fasting is obviously much greater stressor than for humans like for humans they can fast for much longer than but for a mouse 48 hours of fasting equals like almost you know five days of fasting in humans or <laughs> does that actually translate over to humans uh, in terms of the results we don't know uh that's all i can say yeah it's a good question i have been contacted by people who do like two days a week complete fasting um uh, on those two days my assumption would be that there's quantitatively more activation of these adaptive stress response pathways autophagy uh, than there would be say before eating lunch if you're doing if you're doing daily time restricted eating skipping breakfast mm. but on the other hand the frequency will be less yeah yeah i think um, it has to be kind of a balance and like uh we don't know if you're like if you're like more how much is better or what's the optimal dose and uh, yeah. <laughs> i kind of think as well and uh even then like even if there weren't even if they yeah, are like in order to get the same life extension benefits you would have to fast for yeah, like maybe five or seven days all the time even then like just the daily time sheet eating is still good for the insulin sensitivity and uh, the metabolic switching and maybe sleep and uh cognitive function and those kinds of things even if it didn't extend your lifespan you still get like other he he beneficial effects on the health span and just overall vitality the thing that i i like about daily time restricted eating it's, it's just it's easy mm. uh you know i'm productive in the morning i think fasting two days a week completely then eating you know breakfast lunch dinner the other five days uh i don't know my guess is that there'd be a big difference in my cognition and productivity uh I know it's two days compared to the five days and I, I don't know how well your everything adapts because it yeah I, I don't know we're kind of diurnal creatures and and having some fasting pattern I, I just don't know yeah 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 I guess I just you know just confine your eating window maybe a little bit don't eat from uh, the moment you wake, wake up until the moment you go to bed don't over eat calories and you know, exercise of course and uh yeah just maybe impose your body under this positive stressor a little bit that's kind of maybe the most practical takeaway for most people yeah yeah so i think you know if if you get a chance to look at my book everybody i have a lot of chapters goes starts out with an evolutionary perspective a historical perspective on people who wrote about and and were proponents of fasting 100 years ago then i go into aging and you know a lot in the mechanisms a lot in the specific diseases cardiovascular disease cancers etc um even things like autism which it turns out that uh women who with obesity or type 2 diabetes during pregnancy it's much more likely that their child will have an autism spectrum disorder than women who are healthy during their pregnancy and you know i talk about mood psyche and that kind of thing and then i have a section on diet uh, composition 
we did a lot of work on uh, that suggests that many of the chemicals in fr fruits and vegetables that are good for our health, the reason they're in the fruits and vegetables is they're like natural pesticides or toxins. They're in the fruits and vegetables for the purpose of keeping insects and us from eating too much of the vital parts of those. And, you know, so it's caffeine, uh, curcumin, which is in turmeric, um, sulforaphane and broccoli, et cetera. All of these healthy chemicals have a very bitter taste. Uh, if, you, if you take caffeine and put it on your tongue, uh, pure caffeine, it's very bitter. Uh, if you have coffee beans or tea leaves sitting on your table, you will never find ants eating them. You know, the ants will avoid these chemicals. So anyway, we evolved. Uh, anyway, I have a, I talk about that. I actually wrote an article for Scientific American on that seven years ago. And then I talk about how intermittent fasting might be incorporated. I talk about, I have a chapter on practical aspects. How does one, what might be the easiest for a person, what to expect, what's going on in the brain. Then I have some on how intermittent fasting might be incorporated into healthcare systems, medical education and all that. And then I have a chapter, which I mentioned on the dark forces. Hmm. So, a lot of information uh, and, you know, hopefully that will help some of your people understand uh, the science and practical aspects and, and the future. Nice, nice, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll be bringing it all in the show notes as well then, but we can, we can get, get the book. Ah, just go to Amazon, just put, Mark Matt, if you just Google Mark Matson book, <laughs> it has a, it has this. Uh, you'll see that you'll see this. Mm, you nice. can get it from Amazon. Nice, good. You have any fun questions or anything there? No. Mm. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been great talking. And my last question is: uh, what, What's this one piece of advice or habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Ah, what you're doing, resistance training, <laughs> core work. I, I, was, I started running in the 1970s, okay? In the 1970s, runners, elite runners, they, their training was they ran. Mm. There was no cross training. There, they did no core work, resistance training. Uh, and somehow, and I, you know, I think I'm fairly intelligent, but somehow I never, I never started doing core work or resistance training to any extent. Mm. And it came back to bite me. Two years ago, uh, well, a little before that, so I'm like my mid 60s now started to have some knee osteoarthritis. So I decided to switch from trail running to mountain bike riding. And two years ago, I had an accident. That was not a good situation. I complete on my right side, I completely tore my rectus abdominis from the pubic bone. Mm. And I had partial tearing of the adductor on the right, and I had some less damage on the left. So I went through three surgeries to try to, rep uh, to repair that. And then uh, during the recovery, like my adductors were weak. Uh, and I started having pain and uh, associated with the uh, peroneal tendons on the outside of the feet which I still have. So I have this 
Like my biggest problem now is this peroneal tendonitis. I had MRI, I don't have like any obvious tears in the tendons, but my adductors are still somewhat weak. And anyway, my guess is if I would have done core training and resistance training, that, that I wouldn't have got that damage. Mm. Um, I don't know for sure, but it just seems like it makes a lot of sense to me. Mm. The other thing with that is uh, during aging, see, I'm, I'm actually pretty weak. <laughs> But you can you can see my muscle, mm. and um, actually it looks bigger if I do. <laughs> but uh, yeah, also with age with aging, and I really didn't know that I wasn't really into aging research for a long time. Uh, it is important to maintain muscle mass as you get older, and uh, you have to get exercise to do that. So I'm doing some light mm. stuff with light weights my core i still have some core issues so i can't put like real strain on that um actually i had a hernia because of and this is really long story but so they did the surgery and where they did the surgery and where the scar tissue was i ended up having a hernia and i had to have that repaired so all of this stuff it's kind of snowballed. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, do your car work, do some resistance training, don't overdo it and, and also get some aerobic yeah. conditioning. Um, look at your resting heart rate. It, you know, it'll go down with aerobic exercise and it's actually a good way to monitor your, you should keep track of what your resting heart rate is. And power. But intermittent fasting will lower and resting heart rate and reduce blood pressure in most people. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And it's also resistance is also one of those things that wasn't, let's say, popularized and wasn't uh, promoted uh, maybe until a few years ago. Maybe it's becoming more popular. But yeah, like in the mainstream health, it has never been like. Like a very popular thing it's always been like cardio but it's coming coming back like intermittent fasting as well you know but personally i my experience is that exercise is more important has more beneficial effects on the brain and body than intermittent fasting yeah i, I agree yeah because when i had to when i had to stop exercising because of all these surgeries i got i got depressed <laughs> You know, and it's very frustrating for someone who's used to, you know, doing that. So mm -hmm. I still do intermittent fasting, but I, my own experience is exercise is like more important. It's important to keep your weight down. Yeah. Uh, intermittent fasting can help you do that. Uh, it may have some benefits beyond calorie restriction. It seems to particularly for the brain uh, exercises as important or more important. Yeah, I agree. Uh, well, yeah, good luck with the recovery and uh, thanks for yeah. coming to the podcast. It was great to talk. Um, oh. yeah. Okay, Sim, it was good to talk to you again. Nice to meet you, Inka, and maybe a few years down the road, we can touch base again. Yeah, sounds good. Nice talking to you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.